poet, a journalist, an activist um, for women's suffrage and the anti-lynching campaigns. But it's also important to remember that she was a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a friend, a partner, a wife. So she occupied so many roles and identities during her lifetime. And just thinking about her being born in 1875 in New Orleans, being part of that first generation of free Black people after emancipation, um, she witnessed so much of the shifts and tensions in this nation as Black people sought to define themselves as people in a country that wanted to deny their humanity. So it's important to contextualize um, and think about the period in which she was born because it influences her writing um, about her own Blackness and how she situated herself in the world. And it influenced her curricula as an educator um, to uplift Black youth. And it also influenced her involvement in passing the dire anti-lynching bill. So she was definitely a woman of her time and used her multiple identities and roles to imagine a better life, not only for herself, but for Black Americans more generally. Um, and as much as she was a woman of her own time, I think we can also see through the exhibition that she's also a woman of this time. When we were planning this exhibition, um, our initial focus was on Dunbar Nelson's relevancy to 2020 and the importance of celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage and how it connects to Alice Dunbar Nelson's activism. Um, but as this year has shown, discussing and highlighting Alice Dunbar Nelson is relevant now more than ever when we think about her experience with police violence and violence against Black women more generally, as it connects to the murder of Breonna Taylor and the murders of Black trans women um, that we see through some of these issues surrounding voter disenfranchisement as well and access to polls or ballots. So Alice Dunbar Nelson's uh, life matters in 2020 because through the exhibition and looking at her life, we look at this Black woman's uh, life and legacy to see that we are still fighting the same political, racial, economic, and social issues that Alice Dunbar Nelson faced herself and that foregrounds so much of her work. What's the main theme of the exhibition, I Am an American? Well, I think, as it says in the title, <laughs> um, to highlight her life and activism. Um, but I think it's also to reveal some of the intricacies and complexities of 20th century Black women's lives. And while Alice Dunbar Nelson does not and cannot serve as a model for all Black women during the early 20th century, I think utilizing her archive and her personal papers informs us of how the past impacts the present and more importantly, how history repeats itself. Um, also, there hasn't been a major exhibition of Alice Dunbar Nelson's life uh, before the one that we have now. So I Am an American opens the door to possibilities of interpreting her life while also educating visitors about the importance of her legacy. And it's significant that she played such an important role in the histories of Wilmington, Delaware and Philadelphia. And um, this is in these histories. And when we're thinking about these towns, black women are often erased. So I'm hoping that once visitors have a chance to really explore the exhibition more, it will inspire them to rethink about the histories in these cities and to um, dig further into other hidden histories. What approach did you and your co-curator, Dr. Jesse Erickson, also of the University of Delaware, uh, take to the interpretation put forward in the digital exhibition? Per your earlier points, there are so many different interpretive directions to take. How did you focus in and create a narrative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. and. Um, when Jesse and I first met to talk about the exhibition, we really wanted to be intentional about how we presented Alice Dunbar Nelson's narrative. 
uh, we came to this collection at different points in our careers with my engagement being more recent um, during my first year of graduate school. Um, but I think we stumbled across this collection at the perfect moment in our lives, um, as if we were supposed to engage with this collection. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity and the University of Delaware Special Collections uh, to be able to do this work. And before joining the exhibition, I had solely focused on Alice Dunbar Nelson's unpublished manuscript, This Lofty Oak, and her romantic relationship with educator Edwina Cruz. But once I sat down to look at the entire collection and had more conversations with Jesse, I realized that this narrative is complicated <laughs> and it cannot be told in a singular way. So Jesse and I wanted to make sure we honored the complexities of Alice Dunbar Nelson's life, um, not only in their totality, but also how they show up in the collection and in the papers. Uh, there's so much to look at. Um, it's a very vast collection. So we weren't looking to tell a singular story, but instead presenting multiple aspects of Alice Dunbar Nelson's life because that's how she lived her life and that's how she defined herself. So in the same way that she didn't confine herself, we also didn't want to confine her when thinking about how to present her narrative in this exhibition. Um, so I'm hoping that as visitors explore the exhibition, um, our vision is clear with that and that visitors recognize that multiple stories are being told. Monet, we're holding this conversation in the aftermath of another instance of police violence right here in Philadelphia, which resulted in the murder of Walter Wallace Jr. on Monday night. As you have already mentioned, Alice Dunbar Nelson uh, was herself a survivor of police violence, and she was also a passionate teacher. If Dunbar Nelson were here with us tonight, what guidance do you think she might offer about creating meaningful political and social change in the name of equal justice for all. What insights do you think she might share about the impact of violence on the well being of Black communities, the entire nation, and especially our nation's children? Yeah, thank you for that question, Alex. And um, just for acknowledging what is happening right now, not only in Philly, but across the world as people continue to protest and fight for justice for Black lives. Um, yeah, I, I'm still trying to grapple with Walter Wallace's death and murder. And yeah, it, it really is a lot. Um, but I think in thinking about Alice Dunbar Nelson's experience with police violence, like Walter Wallace, um, she was attacked by a white officer without provocation. Um, so we continue to see how this disruption of Black life um, by white officers continues today. And Alice Dunbar Nelson was also an advocate of anti-lynching, as I mentioned earlier. And I would like to suggest that the continued police violence and killings of Black people is a modern day form of lynching, where these killings are often recorded, public, um, and officers are not reprimanded for their actions. So if we can think about Alice Dunbar Nelson, uh, Alice Dunbar Nelson here today and what she would say, I think she would support and stand in solidarity with protesters because even in her own fight to bring justice to her experience, um, she would encourage people to continue to, to fight for justice in their own experiences. Um, and I don't think that she, she would not only encourage these protesters um, to protest, but as a writer, she would remind people to write about what's going on, to document the present moment, and for people to take action through their respective platforms to, do, to demand justice as she did for herself. Um, even though her case was dismissed, that's a whole other conversation about what happens um, when Black people face are met with police violence and nothing is done. Um, but I think she would also remind us that the murders of Black people by white officers not only impact the victim, but the family, the communities, and the nation. Um, Walter Wallace's mother watched her son die in front of her after begging the police not to shoot. 
neighbors watch their community member being killed and his children are not going to grow up with a father. So when we think about the well-being of black communities and protesters involved in this fight for justice, we also have to recognize the trauma um, and with some of this trauma already existing for most communities, especially when we think about the Philadelphia community where there's already this distrust between law enforcement and black people with this longer history of police violence. So as an educator, I think Alice Dunbar Nelson would use her platform to speak to the youth, um, especially black youth about what's going on because this violence impacts their futures as well. And while the conversations are difficult, they are necessary if we want to imagine a future free from systemic racism and state sanctioned violence. It almost goes without saying that uh, our society here in the United States is deeply polarized. Uh, what role can uncovering and interpreting stories like those of Alice Dunbar Nelson play in informing productive civic discourse? And how can museums and libraries engage in this kind of work and pursue this kind of civic action without being perceived as you know, engaging in partisan politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of institutions should consider and revisit, especially now. And as Bethany said earlier, um, you know, museums and libraries cannot remain neutral. It's almost impossible. So uncovering and interpreting stories, especially those of black women, um, queer and trans people and other marginalized communities like those that Alice Dunbar Nelson belonged to reveals many of the issues we still grapple with today. And instead of obscuring or erasing these narratives in fear of confronting these issues, museums and libraries actually have a civic duty to bring these stories to life through education and interpretation. And there shouldn't be this fear about being perceived as political because everything we do is political, whether we mean for it to be or not. So in the same way that choosing to uncover these stories is political, choosing not to do so is also political since it continues the erasure of these important histories that actually impact current visitors and audiences to these spaces. Ultimately, libraries and museums have a responsibility to their communities and to future generations to shed light on these uncomfortable and messy histories, um, especially as these histories resurface in the cities of these institutions. The final question I have for you, Monet, is a little bit more technical in nature. Um, this exhibition about Alice Dunbar Nelson was originally planned as an on-site gallery show to be installed uh, at the Rosenbach. Uh, what was it like to transition uh, what had been planned as an on-site show into a born digital product, a website? What opportunities did this new format allow in terms of outreach, but what challenges did uh, that transition pose? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's something that, again, many organizations and institutions are having to accept for most of our planned on-site events we had for this year. And I actually remember the meeting that we had when we were trying to figure out as a team to switch to a born digital exhibition. Uh, I know we were worried about whether the theme and the argument and the intention would still appear and come through uh, through a born digital exhibition. However, thanks to our wonderful team and our graphic designer, Marianne Casey, we were still able to capture our original vision while making the exhibition more accessible to a larger and more diverse audience. So I'm actually happy about that. <laughs> and I think that uh, that transition still upheld our original commitment to reach a wider audience, because I know that was also a conversation that we were having in the initial planning stage. So with a Born Digital exhibition, there's also just been so many more opportunities to share this work and collaborate with other organizations. So. For example, as I'm sure a lot of you know, we were able to collaborate with organizations such as Women in Transition last week uh, with the poetry reading. Uh, we're planning things with Women Against Abuse, 
both organizations based in Philly that focus on violence and abuse against women, which gives us a space um, not only to share Alice Dunbar Nelson's experiences with domestic and intimate partner violence, but also to honor current survivors. So um, there are more opportunities for education as well. Um, educators can use the exhibition uh, from across the country. They can show this exhibition to their students without physically having to plan a trip to the museum or worrying about having access to these materials. So I'm grateful for the opportunities that have been presented because the exhibition is digital and more people can visit and learn more about Alice Dunbar Nelson. Thank you so much, Monet, for sharing your insights with us. You've already given us so much to think about, both uh, in terms of the story of Alice Dunbar Nelson herself and how that story gets interpreted uh, for our own time. Uh, we'd now love to open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, so feel free uh, to take a few moments, those of you joining us this evening, if you have any follow-up questions, comments, discussion points, that you'd be interested in, in hearing Monet talk about, uh, please enter them into the chat box. Uh, and my colleague, Emily Parker, the Rosenbachs Director of Education and Interpretation uh, will share some of those questions uh, as, they, as they are submitted, as they come in. Uh, I would encourage you, I mean, be comfortable to take a, a few moments to think about the conversation we just heard and uh, formulate some questions. That you, that you might like to have answered. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Emily. And Alex, as everybody's thinking about what their questions and comments are, uh, Bethany has actually already provided us with a question uh, for both Monet and Alex. Uh, she's asking um, if you could both tell us more about working with the advisory committee uh, that was organized for the exhibition. Uh, she knows that it was a highly collaborative project along the way and really wants to hear more about the members of the advisory committee. Happy yeah. to address that. Monet, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I can start. Um, yeah, it's been absolutely great having an advisory committee uh, for this exhibition. Um, with this being my first time on an exhibition project and planning and co-curating, I found this as a very great model um, just for how I would like future work to, to go. Um, We've had, we have so many different people on the advisory committee, students, educators, activists, poets. Um, and I'm just really grateful for everyone who's committed their time to thinking about this exhibition, um, to just giving their input based on their own respective um, backgrounds. And I think it's really helped bring our vision to light and yeah, I'm just very grateful to be able to work with the advisory committee. Um, and I think this is how a lot of exhibitions should be ran. Um, there should be this collaboration between community members, um, students, staff, faculty, whoever's interested in this, in this history, they should be able to have the opportunity to have an input into the exhibition itself. I second everything Monet has said about the experience of working with the advisory committee. And just to lend a little bit of context from the Rosenbach perspective, it became very clear early in the development of this project, long before you know, we were thinking about the digital pivot or the impact of the pandemic on the work, that to truly represent Alice Dunbar Nelson's story in its full complexity, or at least to aspire to do so, and to you know, speak to the audiences we hope to reach with the project, we knew that we would have to um, engage a broad community from the very beginning of the work. And we really tried to develop an approach to curation in collaboration with Jesse Erickson and Monet Timmons, the, the actual curators of the show, that would be community driven. And um, through the, the hard work, of the curators and you know, my colleagues at the Rosenbach and the Free Library, we were able to assemble a group that averaged around 25 members. There were some um, who came and went as the process wore on. But this committee of community advisors was really instrumental at every stage of the project. They were involved in conceptualizing an interpretation of Alice Dunbar Nelson, 
reviewing the text, the actual exhibition script, and finally helping us think about graphic design, which was a really wonderful and fascinating experience. So um, there was a strong sense of this works having um, a polyphonic voice in a way. Um, the, the entire project really represents a, a community effort uh, to, to bring this story to life. Um, and as, as Monet indicated, there were uh, scholars on the committee, graduate students, uh, activists, artists, writers, and so on and so forth, um, all of whom played a key role in bringing, bringing this project to fruition. If you're interested in learning more, uh, when you visit the digital exhibition, you'll see that there's a making of tab that gives a little bit more of this history. And I will say for those of you who are curious to learn more, and we're very happy to talk about the process that went into this work because it's, it proved to be a highly useful and meaningful experience for everyone involved. And our next question is from Liza. Liza actually has two questions. I'm gonna start with her first question uh, because the, the second question is sort of multi-part. Uh, and the first question I'm imagining is gonna be a little bit easier for, for you all to answer. Uh, so she is wondering which of, of Alison Bar Nelson's works uh, should someone who is new to her uh, start reading? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'm going to have to go back to her first work that she wrote in 1895. Um, she was very young. She was only 20 years old, um, Violets and Other Tales. Um, it's a collection of poetry and short stories, but I think every poem and short story just has something about it that just captures who she is and what she cared about at the time. Um, so there's romance, there's drama, there's heartbreak, um, but it really is a great way to just survey um, Alice Dunbar Nelson's writing style more generally. And another work I would actually suggest is her diary, which is published by and edited by um, Akasha Gloria Hull, and it's called Give Us Each Day. And um, the diary entry entries actually offer just a lot of Alice Dunbar Nelson's own personal experiences and her everyday lived experiences, um, just everything that she went through um, as a woman, uh, it was she wrote a lot of these uh, diary entries in the 1930s before her passing. So she's really reflecting on her life um, and her career, and just how far she's come. Maybe some things that you know she wished she could still do, but I think it's a great insight into her mind as an intellectual, but also just as a woman uh, living in her time. So thank you for that question. And the second part of Liza's question um, is, what do you think that Alice would say uh, were her most important contributions, uh, literary, literary, political, social? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. And, ooh. I mean, I don't know if I can say all of the above, <laughs> but I think I would add to that list um, her role as an educator as well. Um, when she was teaching at Howard High, she started in 1902. Howard High was the only black high school um, for children in Wilmington, Delaware. And that's where she met Edwina Cruz and she chaired the English department there. And she really took to creating a curriculum that was rigorous, that was classical, um, that was focused on just creating a community of black excellence for the students there. So she really pushed her students. Um, a lot of reviews of Howard High always suggest that, you know, she was, her and Edwina Cruz were really tough on their students, but it was kind of like this tough love ethic um, to really just create another generation of black excellence um, and black educators and black doctors. Um, and to just really think about the future of Black youth. I also would say her literary career as well, even though um, some of her works such as This Lofty Oak and some of her poems were never published um, because of issues with publishing companies and just some of the issues that Black women faced with being published in the first place, she really put her heart and soul into um, 
a lot of her literary work um, and really had a vision for it to become you know, either the great American novel or something that really inspired everyone. But um, I would also say her literary work as well. And I think her literary work um, and even her journalism ties into that social and political aspects of her life as well. So I think when we think about her most important contributions, um, it's important to think about all of them together. And Alex is wondering um, if you could tell us more about the place of storytelling in the work of historical interpretation and the work of civic activism today. What role does the construction of cultural narrative play in shaping social movements? And what skills go into crafting narratives to shape our senses of our shared social experiences? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I think storytelling has definitely been part of um, this exhibition and co-curating the exhibition as well. Um, especially when we're looking at a figure from the past who is no longer with us, um, it isn't as easy to just ask them their opinions or how they want to see themselves. So it really requires, especially when using archival documents and the personal papers of a figure, um, this work really requires you to sit with the material, to understand the historical context of this person, um, the time in which they were living, um, how they were reacting to their social worlds. And I think in doing that, you kind of in a way start thinking about your present moment and your present self, and you start to see parallels. You start to notice oh, this is still happening today, or, oh, maybe this isn't happening, or maybe it's showing up in a different form. So I think when we're thinking about the cultural narrative um, and shaping these cultural narratives, it does require us to think of social movements um, in the past and in the present as well. And in terms of the skills that go into crafting these narratives to shape our senses of um, our shared experiences, yeah, I think for that part, um, it, it requires intention. It requires, I think in my case, taking on a Black feminist praxis, um, one that requires us to consider all parts of Black women's lived experiences or the lived experiences of any subject that we're looking at. And to really just think about how the past really does inform where we are today. So I hope that answered your question, Alex. Uh, and Derek is wondering uh, how complete are the holdings, uh, the Alistair Bernelson holdings at the University of Delaware? Where, in other words, um, can we hope to find undiscovered additional letters, diaries, or other original writings uh, from her that shed light on her work and life? Or has it all been captured? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so her niece, Pauline Young, was actually responsible for bringing the collection to the University of Delaware. Um, and even after Alice Dunbar Nelson's passing, she really sought to um, just bring the collection together more holistically. And it's amazing that these papers were preserved um, the way that they were. I mean, it's very telling and it's very rare to have this vast a collection of a Black woman's uh, writings and scrapbooks and everything that encompassed her daily life. So I think even with that, that's, I mean, just to have access to that has been a blessing uh, when doing this work. But in terms of can we find more additional letters? I mean, Jesse and I, there's always something that we kind of discover or rediscover when we look at the papers, whether we notice um, a new figure who's mentioned, and then we're able to make connections between history, or um, even with reading the letters, sometimes you'll catch a phrase or a reference to another person or um, some type of social event that's going on. So I think, that's kind of where we find those undiscovered um, aspects of the collection. If there are any 
other Alice Dunbar Nelson papers across the country. I mean, that would also be interesting as well. I don't know. I haven't um, actually heard of Alice Dunbar Nelson's papers being really anywhere else besides at UD, at least not in this vast, uh, as this vast of a collection. So yeah, <laughs> that would be interesting to find out though, for sure. And Kelsey is wondering, um, who was Alison Burnelson reading? Uh, who were her literary heroes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, these are really great questions. <laughs> that's also a really great question. Um, and with that, I mean, she was so well versed in literature. Um, and I think even as a writer herself, she was always thinking about her interactions with other writers, um, especially during the Harlem Renaissance, when she was working with um, a lot of different writers and reviewing their work as well. Um, so I think that's also very important to consider just her role within the Harlem Renaissance where she's often erased um, from that history. But in terms of who she was reading uh, during her life, she actually has um, a whole book. She kept a little journal um, where she made a list of all of the writers, or I'm sorry, all of the books that she was reading during her lifetime. Um, but she was definitely engaged with um, Phyllis Wheatley and a bit of her early poetry. Um, she was also very well versed with uh, James Weldon Johnson's work, Georgia Douglas Johnson's work. Um, so these are just like some of the very few people who influenced her life, um, who influenced her writing, but they were also, some of these people were um, also her friends. So, yeah. I don't know what happened to my video, but yeah. <laughs> That was my fault, Monet, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I turned you off for a minute. It's okay. um, so Peter is asking, how did the idea to do this exhibition originate? Who and when, how did it get up off the ground? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that, I'd actually have to point to Jesse Erickson. He has, I mean, he spent so much more time with this collection, um, really just studying it creating classes and courses around it as well. So Jesse has been very invested in this collection. Um, and he actually was in conversation with the Rosenbach Museum a couple of years ago. So before I even knew that there was going to be an exhibition, Jesse was already um, on it and thinking of ways to honor Alice Dunbar Nelson through an exhibition. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> Shout out to Jesse for that um, and very grateful as well um, to Jesse for asking me to be part of this project um, and to co curate with him. It's been a wonderful experience, especially as a grad student, to be able to have that mentorship and that guidance and the exposure to a curator field, um, which is something I'm considering for my future career. So, yeah. Okay, uh, and Jovi is asking um, more about the advisory committee and says that it really sounds like a true collaboration with the curatorial team. And uh, is the Rosenbach uh, planning on using community advisory committees for future exhibitions uh, and um, in order to reach a more diverse audience moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, and I think this, this may actually be a question uh, for Alex, um, so maybe I can invite Alex to um, to come back on to answer that one. Sure, I'm I'm happy to answer that question, and I think it's safe to say that this process, this curatorial process, and the the involvement of the of an advisory committee really transformed our view uh, of of the work process for doing uh, exhibitions. For curating exhibitions, and you know, while we are only in very beginning stages 
of talking about the, the next exhibitions that the Rosenbach will be pursuing. And of course, there's still so much up in the air because of the pandemic uh, in terms of what exactly our exhibition program will look like in the near future. There is certainly a commitment to building on the work undertaken in this project at really highlighting and um, making use of community uh, guidance and wisdom as we create projects. I think one lesson that we learned from this endeavor is that each content area, each subject that we might want to pursue as a major exhibition project really requires building the infrastructure around it to create the end product that we want. So I would, we may not necessarily take precisely this model and apply it to the next topic because it might not fit perfectly on the next topic. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I think is so amazing about this particular project is that you know, we were able, we were so fortunate to be able to connect early on with Jesse Erickson, with Monet, and with so many other leaders in our community who could sort of guide our work, guide our collective work. Um, that was fortuitous. You know, I think we'll, we will always have to be very cognizant of the challenges and opportunities that, are, that emerge from each topic uh, and from each set of materials that we want to highlight in the exhibition medium. But that said, I think that there will be a continued commitment to community-driven curation as we move forward with our work. And I think to add to that as well, to Alex's point, um, I think with people, now that the exhibition is online and our process um, for the exhibition is more open, more transparent, um, we've shared a lot of information about you know, how we came to this project, um, what's been made possible. I think it will also open people to reach out to the Rosenbach Museum and see how they can get involved themselves. And like Alex said, depending on the subject matter or uh, what the Rosenbach plans to exhibit, I think everyone will be able to find themselves within uh, these histories and these narratives and be able to apply themselves to it. Wonderful. Um, and then I can just uh, reiterate some of the messages um, in the chat. Um, and some, some thanks going to uh, Jesse and Monet, uh, as well as Yolanda Wisher. Uh, so Derek uh, really wants to get across that point, um, how wonderful um, they have all been as collaborators. And he also mentions, uh, Derek mentions that Joby's question about the uh, advisory committees, um, that the answer should be an emphatic yes. Uh, the Rosenbach would benefit fit greatly from community input about its major initiatives on an ongoing basis. Yeah, for sure. And I think another thing that has been very special about having an advisory committee is just seeing how involved um, a lot of the advisory committee members are. Um, with that, I'm thinking alone of the podcast, the Voices of Change podcast that we recorded um, over a span of several weeks. And most of the episodes involve advisory committee members. So it's very interesting to um, hear their voices, to have them involved, um, and to just really see their stake within the exhibition as well. Great, thank you so much, Renee. And so following up on that topic of the, um, of the podcast, um, if you do, um, if anyone in the audience does think of any more questions and comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I did want to just to sort of close this out today uh, to have both of you talk a little bit more about these uh, amazing podcasts that are related with the project. So if I could ask Alex to come back on um, to join Monet in, in um, letting us know more about that project. Sure, Monet, do you wanna offer any further comments on the podcast? Yeah, I can talk about that briefly. Um, 
Yeah, I was excited when Alex presented the idea for us to do a podcast. Um, and I think it goes back to the earlier question that you asked Alex about what has been possible uh, by having a born digital exhibition. Um, it's the ability to talk more about the exhibition through different platforms and one of those platforms being a podcast. So that was definitely exciting to um, focus more on some of these issues and these topics, uh, but also to just see a wide range of topics that are possible to even cover with this exhibition alone. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's all right. I mean, the exciting thing about the digital pivot, as we have come to term it, uh, is was this reimagining of medium and the tools that we could use. And the idea of the podcast um, you know, emerged quickly in the conversation about how to take our content and really reinterpret it in a way that could help us reach new audiences. So when you go to alicedunbarnelson.com, you will see that there is a, a menu tab for the podcast, for the Voices of Change podcast. The series consists of eight episodes and each of the episodes was designed uh, really thinking about you know, general, general audience members uh, of the Rosenbach and new audience members who may not necessarily instantly um, connect to um, the historical narrative of the exhibition, but are very interested in the modern resonances of the exhibition. So the idea was to use each episode as a way to highlight how history, art, and literature can inform uh, you know, our, our present day circumstances. So as Monet mentioned, most though, though not all of the episodes uh, are, are, inter are interview based, conducted with um, members of the advisory committee and others who helped us with the exhibition project and offer insights into topics like um, preserving LGBTQ history, um, our, our archives as a form of activism, police violence, um, fr framing Alice Dunbar Nelson as a queer figure, uh, all sorts of different topics that really help this exhibition content connect to our modern themes. Our initial statistics suggest that the podcast is being well listened to um, by our community and beyond our community, so we're thrilled about that, and it's been very exciting to work. In this, in this new medium for us. And so I do I really invite you to check out the podcast episodes uh, and uh, hopefully enjoy them. Thank you, Alex. I'll uh, put the link to the podcasts in the chat. Um, but before we close out this evening, uh, Liza actually asked a question about publicizing the exhibition uh, and is hoping that we are publicizing it um, widely um, and on uh, the Free Library's social media and email list. And Liza, we certainly are, um, but I actually wanted um, to invite Alex to answer one more question. Um, and that is about the, um, the outreach programs that we plan on doing in order to reach out to broad audiences. Uh, so quite a few of those are already underway in collaboration with our um, partner, the Free Library. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question, Emily. It's a really important point that, again, with the, with the digital pivot and you're thinking about this as an online product, we knew that we had to leverage our community partnerships to, to really reach the new audiences we wanted to serve. And so outreach, while always a priority, really became a priority with this project. And um, there were a few, you know, I mean, the, the opportunities are sort of endless with a life as varied and diverse as Alice Dunbar Nelson's in terms of directions to take that, that sort of outreach. But um, there were a few key, really salient points that emerged from the research that Jesse and Monet did uh, for, for the curation of the show, um, one of which was Alice Dunbar Nelson's status as a survivor of intimate partner violence committed by the hand at the hands of her more famous husband, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And we knew that we had not only, you know, the opportunity to talk about this important theme, but also an obligation to survivors of intimate partner violence and those who may be experiencing this in their community to put, uh, create resources to, to help them find assistance. We fortunately were able to establish 
uh, connections with the Philadelphia organizations, Women in Transition and Women Against Abuse, uh, both of whom helped us shape that interpretation, which you will encounter in the digital exhibition itself, uh, textual you know, content, part of the exhibition script. But just as importantly, they you know, really have been great partners programmatically as well. So as Monet mentioned earlier, uh, last week, last Wednesday, Monet represented us actually at a poetry reading sort of co-sponsored with Women in Transition called Amplifying Our Voices. The exhibition was promoted during that event. We are also working on a second major collaborative endeavor with Women in Transition, which will be sort of a discussion circle, reading group, reading club uh, for survivors of intimate partner violence and their allies. Uh, that will probably be happening in early 2021 probably in February, depending on how scheduling goes, that program is under development. And we're thrilled that both Jesse and Monet uh, have agreed to be a part of that effort. Uh, the, it will really be led uh, by women in transition because they're the trained professionals in uh, education around those particular topics, but we're going to be there as strong support to lend this historical context. So this is a really exciting collaboration that we've been able to pursue, especially now that the exhibition is up available online, we're devoting more time to those programmatic areas. I will also say that we have some exciting collaborations under development with the uh, Free Library of Philadelphia and their uh, current exhibition in the West Gallery, Making Her Mark, which deals with women's suffrage and does highlight Alice Dunbar Nelson. We are working on a collaborative program that will examine um, radical self-care in an age of civic activism and you know, civic crisis. How do we as citizens care for ourselves and each other as we seek to better our world? That program will be virtual as well um, and will probably happen in February as well. Uh, so there are a lot of outreach programs that we are developing. Of course, these collaborative endeavors are complex but hold really so much potential to help us reach new audiences with content. So please be watching our email communications uh, for more information about those endeavors as they uh, go live. And I'd also like to add um, as well that Jesse has organized a symposium uh, through the interdisciplinarity Interdisciplinary Humanities Research Center at the University of Delaware. Um, so that symposium will be taking place um, November 6th from 11 to 3 p.m. Um, I'll put the link in the chat box, um, but we'll also be joined by one of our uh, wonderful committee members, Yolanda Wisher, who will also be involved with the symposium. So if you're free during that time, um, please join as we discuss more about Alice Dunbar Nelson's life. And we'll be joined by other scholars, activists, artists, um, who are also thinking about how to honor her life as well. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, so I think I will invite Alex back to, to close us out for the evening. I, I will echo Emily's thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Monet, for giving us this perspective and showing us uh, the sort of inner workings of this project as it, as it developed over the last few years. Um, it was truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to learn from you this evening and gain your further perspectives on this really important work that you, Jesse, the committee, and so many others associated with the Rosenbach uh, have undertaken uh, to make an important civic impact. I especially want to thank everyone in our, in our Zoom room, uh, in the audience, for joining us for this very special conversation. It is you know, so meaningful and so powerful during difficult times um, to be able to, to have a community uh, that in, in which we can learn from the past and you know, help build a better future uh, together. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do take the time to visit www.alicedunbarnelson.com to explore the digital exhibition. Uh, and to listen to Voices of Change, a podcast inspired by Alice Dunbar Nelson, which you will uh, find on the website, as I mentioned earlier. 
do watch uh, future Rosenbach communications uh, for information on other programs associated with the exhibition. Uh, and we do hope that you have a, a good rest of your evening and we'll look forward to seeing you at future programs. Thank you again to Bethany, uh, Emily, Monet, and all of you for joining us for this evening. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks everyone, have a good night.